joining. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to the next in the series of Osenka webinars as we navigate the new normal. I'm Taste of Blanche, the SVP of Business Development based in Toronto. And first and foremost, I hope this finds all of you and your loved ones still safe, healthy, and, uh, and indoors. Uh, pretty hard to believe it's been four weeks since we started this series of webinars. And for most of us, I guess it's been six, seven weeks of uh, having to adjust to a new way of life, both from a social and a professional perspective. I think we've all been getting used to using new phrases, social distancing, flattening the curve, reopening the economy, all words that probably very few of us knew how to use before this. Uh, <clears throat> but I think most of us will agree that uh, there's very little normal about uh, what we're having to deal with. We're all having to adjust uh, how we interact with each other, how we communicate and how we deal with uh, our day-to-day -day lives. Unprecedented is another term that, I've, that we uh, yeah, use quite frequently. And although I think we all agree the speed by which change has come about has been unprecedented, the need for businesses to adapt to a changing external environment and external challenges is of course not necessarily unprecedented. I think we just have to ask the hotel industry what Airbnb did uh, for their businesses or the taxi industry with Uber or our favorite corner video store, the emergence of Netflix and streaming companies. So change I think is, uh, is clearly part of day-to-day uh, -day lives and, and part of business. And at Asenko, we've always been fo focused uh, on innovation Looking for and finding a, a better way has always been part of our DNA. And we're not scared of being first. Uh, we've been first in a number of technological advancements, first in different jurisdictions, and first in taking on new ways to find value for our clients and their projects. Uh, and we have a number of service offerings that are very well adapted to the uh, changing environment that we find ourselves in at the moment. I'm very pleased to be joined by three esteemed colleagues today to cover a number of topics that are relevant to this changing environment and how uh, our business and our service offering uh, can adapt and can still add value. Uh, we'll start with Robin Kalanchi, who's our Director of Minerals and Metals for Western Canada, uh, who will talk through site visits and how we've already been able to, uh, to conduct site visits, whether from a due diligence uh, for due diligence, whether from a financing or m and activity perspective, how we've been able to, to um, conduct those remotely, quicker and cheaper, and adding the same value to our clients. We'll then turn to Dr. Rajiv uh, Chandra Mohan, who is our Technical Director of Global Operations. Again, uh, <clears throat> very well versed in how we use data, not necessarily big data, but the right data to troubleshoot remotely and add value uh, to operations of our clients. And then we'll finish off with Dr. Doug Bright, who is the Head of Environmental Risk Assessment at Hemera, of course, uh, Senko's North American focused environmental business, who will cover a very interesting topic in eDNA and how that uh, supports environmental assessments, uh, particularly as it pertains to the mining industry. As always, we'll, after each of uh, each three have gone through their presentations, we'll have um, time for Q&A. We'll do it online as before. Uh, find a panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can simply type in questions, hit send, um, and I'll try and um, divide the questions up between the three of them uh, and try and deal with as many questions as we can in the time available. We'll also be uh, circulating this presentation to you afterwards, so you've got uh, contact details for all of us, and you can certainly follow up um, directly uh, in, in any questions that come up afterwards, or indeed if you want to follow up on any of the service offerings on the Senko side. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Robin. Thanks, Tace. I, I, I'm actually doing this um, webcast from the office today. I thought there would be lots, less distractions, but I forgot there was a construction site next to me making all sorts of noise. So hopefully everyone can hear all right. Um, I expect all of us on this call can attest that a physical site visits are a frequent requirement of our industry. Um, whether they come as part of a due diligence exercise or, or a plant -y bottlenecking effort, as Rajiv will talk about, or as confirmation of tie-in points for an expansion design. 
these requirements for a physical review of assets in the field uh, can be really challenging even under ideal conditions. But in today's climate, uh, with the current pandemic environment that we live in and travel restrictions, um, they're, they're particularly restrictive and you could argue that they're actually impossible. Even if we could travel to sites around the world today, uh, the requirement to self-quarantine on either side of that visit would make a one-week visit um, look a lot more like a one-month sentence. So even under ideal conditions, when you can travel and we return to the new normal, the schedule and cost for a physical site visit often dictate the expertise that can be leveraged. By that, I mean you have to juggle around subject matter experts and get them to a remote site at the same time. And in many cases, that can require two to three days of travel on each end. And the associated time, costs, and really the logistical challenge that is getting all of these people to site um, can, can end up in an outcome that falls short of expectations. A site visit at its essence is really just about collecting data. And much like when I go to the grocery store, there's always a little something that I wish I would have remembered after I drive out of the parking lot. With most physical site visits, follow-up can be pretty inefficient. Not only to the operations staff or the people at site who have just put up with you for the time that you've been at site, um, return to their daily work, which they're probably uh, short on time anyways, but the experts who've just left site are in the midst of travel and trying to get back into their daily lives. And so those follow-up questions don't all, always arrive in a timely fashion. And when they do arrive, um, chances are it falls on deaf ears. So a solution to these challenges comes in the form of a virtual site visit. A virtual site visit can be a, a real alternative to a physical site visit, particularly in today's climate, and allows for completion of these site visits um, in, in the face of travel restrictions. And when we do return to the new normal, whatever that may be, I think some of the benefits of a virtual site visit will live on and make them attractive option going forward. Next, please. So Asenko's first experience with a virtual site visit was really born out of necessity. Uh, we had a site visit planned to a remote part of Southeast Asia, um, and it had to be abandoned in midway as travel restrictions were being adopted around the world. So with relatively limited preparation time and, and <laughs> very little technical support from the site, an ad hoc virtual visit idea was born and, and was accomplished. And, and really the results were far more robust than anyone could have expected. With refinements over the last seven or eight weeks, these virtual site visits um, have become adaptable to cover a range of different complexities to suit um, many different site-specific requirements or constraints. The most critical part of these site visits in, in, is the alignment between is the alignment between um, the client and Asenko and the proxies at site to ensure that the objectives are well understood. And, and that will ensure, in turn, that the data collected will support a detailed analysis and, and will really give the targeted result that, that is required from a site visit. In each case, these virtual site visits require careful planning, believe me. And it's critical that we have a, a local proxy. In some cases, the proxy can be a client representative at site, lead metallurgist, the maintenance coordinator, or in cases where Asenko will have offices in the country, they can be provided. In some cases, we could engage a third party to be the proxy, but that obviously wouldn't be our preference. Much time is dedicated to scripting these visits to ensure that everybody understands the key areas of focus and that the data collection is very robust. The analysis of the data can be done in real time or, or near real time if infrastructure supports. And in the worst case, it can be a half a day or a del day of delayed fee feedback, as was the case the first time. The collection is always iterative and with with the reduced time of feedback, this iteration can ensure that all the items of interest, even that one that you forgot at the grocery store, are addressed during the course of the site visit. Preliminary analysis by subject matter experts, whether real time or delayed, um, or, or delayed, can be prioritized and can be collaborative to allow that feedback to the proxy at site or to, or to um, between the client and engineer, such that the clarifications or these additional bits um, can be gathered in a timely fashion. In fact, you can change the course and the direction of a virtual site visit midstream, which, which has been done. One of the main benefits of these virtual site visits is that the digital results afterward can be shared for analysis anywhere around the world. So that means the best subject matter experts in, in, 
in our company can be leveraged to analyze that data without ever having to leave their home offices. And that opens up the, the site visit activities to, um, generally speaking, not only those who have time and are nearby, but the absolute best expertise. Next, please. The outcomes for a virtual site visit are similar to a physical site visit, can be, but can include even more detailed data. In a typical site visit or due diligence report, deliverables generally include uh, photographs, maps, uh, a compilation of the data, and some graphical analysis. Um, in the case of a virtual site visit, these deliverables can also include a 3D model, animated fly-through, laser scan maps, Google productions, such as the simple one I've got here, and even drone overviews. Um, at this point, I would have loved to have been able to show you a, a 3D model fly-through fly generated from a remote site visit, um, but this would apparently blow up our webcast. So if, if you are interested in that um, and to see some of the outcomes in a little bit more detail in a, in a form where I can share that information a little bit uh, more easily, just, just give me a shout. Anyway, um, the timing for a virtual site visit is, is very similar to a physical one. Planning is generally a much more extensive effort. Uh, it usually requires a little bit more time than a, than a physical site visit. However, because there is reduced time for travel, the overall timeline is, is at least as quick and can be, um, can be quicker if the site visit has similar objectives to previous site visits and we can simply leverage some of the planning from earlier site visits. Next, please. Virtual site visits rely on um, really on the available infrastructure, but can be done with very limited technology. As I mentioned, um, in the first instance, there was not much more than a dial-up connection available. So the entire site visit was arranged as a very low tech affair. Um, a lot of cell phones, uh, a lot of very low bandwidth um, connection speed for uploading data, but it was still quite successful. In the cases where there's more robust infrastructure available, this allows for a more complex data transfer and thus better dialogue between proxies and subject matter experts and more fluid conversation between the site and the panel, the panel of analysts that are collected around the world. In any case, none of the infrastructure requirements are particularly arduous and in most cases will already meet the requirements. Um, most, of the, most of the infrastructure that will be available at sites will already meet those requirements. Um, in the first case, as with the first case, the extent of the site visit can really be adjusted to meet the constraints of the site. So if your site has, uh, has simply um, uh, a satellite connection where you can only download information very quickly, then, then the script of the data collection will be adjusted accordingly. I mentioned before, but it's worth stating a second time, that, that the proxies are really key. Ideally, they are site-based resources that have a familiarity with the site and have already been um, indoctrinated to the safety culture. Um, or a Senko, a Senko representatives from places where we have uh, where we have offices, and I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. Um, the cost of a virtual site visit are, are generally a little bit less than physical site visits, mostly because you've eliminated all of the costs associated with travel uh, of many of the experts to site. Imagine instead of having all of the required expert, imagine instead instead of having all of the expertise flying to a, a point um, in the middle of the jungle. Imagine instead having all of those experts sitting around a boardroom table in Vancouver, back when we could, I guess we could have a virtual boardroom table now, review, reviewing that data collaboratively and in near real time, and then feeding directions back and adjustments back to the proxy at site so that you can change course or get more detail on specific parts of the site visit that are critical. Next, please. So I just want to mention a couple of case studies, let's call them marks one and two, to show the development of site visits uh, virtual site visits over the last couple of months. So in the first case, as I mentioned, we had a client that wanted a detailed technical review of a remote site in Southeast Asia. Um, this effort was in progress and had to be abandoned midstream due to the onset of travel restrictions. So the planning was very limited. And, and you could even say last minute, which is kind of true to my form. And most of the visit was completed ad hoc and with little or no technological support. Since that time, um, some of the learning and refinements since that visit and some of the other visits in between, we've applied those to make much more robust site visits. As an example, Mark II, which is currently in the planning phase, for a, is for a site visit in Brazil. Mark II is, is going to include drone footage, a 3D fly-through, remember that one I couldn't show you from before, and uh, as well as um, improved iterative feedback because of an improved infrastructure. Next, please. So just to, 
Oh, this is excellent. This is actually a surprise to me. Um, so this is a, actually an example of what resulted from that Mark I visit. So the client provided us uh, a, a simple flow sheet and the task was detail this for us. And so you can see the difference between the initial um, perception of what was available at site and what actually was uh, returned from the virtual site visit. Now, this is a graphical representation, so maybe um, there's a lot of detail on there to follow up, but uh, it gives you an idea of the level of detail that could be generated um, from a virtual site visit. And again, this was from the one that was cell phone and dial-up connections. Next, please. So to summarize, virtual site visits are, 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 at least we think, a solution that can be provided when a site visit is required, such as a, a due diligence exercise, as I mentioned, but, but really not possible given the travel restrictions of today. Um, virtual site visits really could become a viable option to complete a physical site visit uh, as they do offer cost advantages, timing advantages, and, and generally um, can generate much more robust outcomes. The virtual site visits do not require any specialized infrastructure, um, and, and the scope can be adjusted or tailored to meet the constraints of whatever the infrastructure available at site is. Um, these, the, the scope of these site visits, what, what areas get focused on, how much detail can really be adaptable and, and almost adaptable in real time. And it's always an iterative process to allow for adjustments as we go. Um, as I mentioned, having a virtual site visit allows Asenco to leverage the best experts, no matter where they are in the world. Um, so it means some of them may have to stay up through the night, but that's okay, we're happy to do that. And the outcome is, is a digital record of the site visit, which uh, can form the basis for uh, highly engaging information, whether that's um, simple engineering uh, documentation or whether that's a marketing fly through. And again, apologies for not being able to show it. Um, that information is a, is a much more detailed record and a complete record that can be shared, uh, shared around the world um, as required. Um, so that, that's a little summary of uh, a virtual site visit. With that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Rajiv. Thanks, Robin, uh, for the introduction. And uh, Thais, uh, thanks again for giving me the opportunity to present to the wider group here um, virtually. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, to, yeah, so to reiterate what Robin was uh, highlighting, uh, there are a number of ways we can actually engage with sites uh, remotely, given the current circumstance. You know, we cannot travel to site, and uh, and some of the sites are remote, and it's there are ways in tools and methods what Robin highlighted, and they are no different to how we use those tools to do undertake optimization work, and how we continue to provide support to some of our clients. So in, in the current circumstance. Uh, so some sites have uh, reduced capacity uh, because the commodity price have changed. Uh, some sites have uh, actually, actually, um, uh, temporarily, actually under uh, care and maintenance, whereas others uh, continue to operate with reduced per personnel at site. So you, three, with two of these cases where some site with sites reduced capacity and some continue to operate with reduced site personnel, there are different levels of um, support where you can provide to site and their teams. So just to start off, uh, so in terms of the opportunities, I think uh, as Robin mentioned, uh, have a proxy at site. It's about building that relationship um, with the site team because you want to collect that data, you want to analyze that data, you want to provide feedback. And once you have that data, as Robin highlighted earlier, is that you can diagnose a plant uh, and you can uh, create, uh, identify plant issues and you can uh, and if I have a solution for a, uh, or deliver a solution rather, uh, what what uh, to overcome any of the inefficiencies at site. And during that whole process, because you have um, proxies at site, it's it's also all, all about sharing the knowledge and some of the insights what we gain from analyzing the data. We happy to share this uh, information back to the site team. As I mentioned earlier, that there's some of the sites are operating with reduced site personnel because of uh, travel restrictions. So this is a great opportunity to provide technical support because they lack some of the, the site people at site, uh, personnel at site to do some of the analysis and provide uh, reporting or analysis to this, uh, the overall um, management team. Ultimately, I think more importantly, it's uh, it's all about driving value. Uh, 
in the current circumstances. Whatever we do what it, with the data or how we collect the data, it, we need to maintain uh, that uh, the outcome should be the value-based outcome. And, and the circumstances are, diff are difficult, and, but there are opportunities to maintain production, uh, maintain cash flow uh, during the current circumstance. Next, please. As I mentioned earlier, that building relationship is uh, important. So this, this um, graphic here was by Greg Lane back in 2007, sort of reiterates or rather reaffirms the whole collaborative process and, or engagement. Uh, you can apply this in projects or with your clients or with uh, how we generally go about doing this uh, engagement process with the client. Ultimately, it's all about building that trust in the relationship. As Rod mentioned, uh, having a site proxy to enable us to collect the information, but we need to build that trust and need to build it firstly, you know, listening is a critical part. And from listening, we need to align what type of data we need and that formalizes some relationship with the site personnel. Once you build that relationship, it becomes easier and, and we can deliver on the solution. Next, please. So just to give a highlight of view on optimization opportunities, I've uh, presented this, uh, I think it's on LinkedIn posting, uh, just to uh, reaffirm what, what uh, our views on the opportunities uh, what we should be addressing right now in the current circumstances. Uh, yeah, so particularly looking at commodity pricing has a big impact. Um, so that means doing some operations have to scale back uh, capacity, particularly the copper mines. Some are even actually uh, under under care and maintenance until things improve. For those operations uh, running at a lower capacity, what can we do to maintain the cash flow? So. The obvious one is if, if possible, uh, we need to redefine the mine plan. And, and that could be a short-term uh, opportunity which may lead to a sustained long-term solution. The next one is uh, if you have multiple lines or multiple equipment, uh, you know, operating cost is a key uh, metric. We can actually reduce the overall uh, OPEX or rather consumables and, and grinding costs, for example. If we can actually, if you're reducing capacity, can we actually switch off entire grinding lines or some of the equipment and while maintaining some level of production? Uh, run, running at minimized operating costs, you, know, you also need to <laughs> make sure the equipment which you're operating is running efficiently as possible. And you know, efficiency can be uh, in the form of, say, for example, if you are impacted by supply chain, uh, for example, if Grinding media is going to be an impact. Uh, can we run uh, the sag or the ball mills differently or configure it differently? Um, there'll be a, a thought piece which will be coming out from Asenko next week um, describing the, that opportunity as a potential risk mitigation, risk, risk mitigation step uh, to maintain production. Uh, in terms of moving schedules, maintenance plan and schedule forward, this is a great opportunity. I see uh, we have critical assets. Uh, they, I know the maintenance team, they have a, a clearly defined uh, a schedule planned out for the, for the entire year. But given the current circumstance, can we move some of that uh, schedule upfront, for the, particularly for these critical assets and make sure these assets are well maintained. And when things improve, we have, have the ability to wrap up as quickly as possible. And lastly, I think it's uh, sort of highlights um, the current circumstance is difficult, but you know, we have technical, we have a lot of consultants and technical people out in the industry. We're here to help and, and maintain the support to our colleagues in, in right across the mining industry and uh, through our subject matter experts, and we can help to prioritize the strategy, evaluate activities and provide general guidance. And, so yeah, next, next, please. To um, describe some opportunities. So this was presented, uh, was posted online at LinkedIn uh, from the previous, uh, this work was done at uh, Penasquito and uh, the outcomes of this work was presented at the SAGMO conference last year. Uh, just to, uh, to provide as an example. So yeah, the circumstance what this was, 
how it was conducted is slightly different, but majority of the, this work was done remotely. Uh, as uh, Robin highlighted earlier, is you know, collecting the data. Make sure you have a site proxy where you can collect the data. We, we did have a site visit, but that's just mainly to um, make sure introduce ourselves to the site team and uh, and build the trust and the relationship going forward. But once you, you can actually do that remotely. So once you establish that, uh, the important thing is how you're gonna collect that data. So, yeah, and you need to understand what the flow sheet is and, and the circuit and use that flow sheet and the data what the site team's providing to benchmark and provide a solution quickly. So the, these are some of the outcomes. So we part of this work. It, it's in fact it's ongoing, uh, and we're still providing uh, support to the technical support to the uh, Newmont team. And what are the key uh, outcomes of this work? Where you uh, help redesign the Sagmon liner system, optimize the uh, uh, grinding circuit control, and revise the crushing circuit strategy. And all of these outcomes are uh, detailed in the paper, uh, which is posted online. Next, please. Another example is uh, we did this work four years ago for FUCAM, a uh, copper gold mine. Uh, it's, it, again, it's a similar sort of outcome and, uh, and step what we conducted at Penasquito. Uh, yeah, this is, FUCAM is basically, look, it's located in Laos and uh, yeah, it, as Robin Harley, it's pretty remote to get to site. It, it's a uh, 24 hour uh, travel. So it can be a costly experience, um, and but the opportunities and the outcomes of this work it sort of reiterates that once you build that trust, uh, you know the site team they were providing us data every day uh, in an Excel format, and we run those uh, we use that data um, the Pi data in fact to run it through our models and provide them feedback immediately, and they can actually tweak the control system or redefine the strategy. Uh, so in terms of the whole work process, it's no different what we've done previously. And what, of course, the current circumstances changed the, the, the travel situation, how we engage with the site team, but the workflow has not changed. Um, so yeah, it's just to summarize, I mean, the important thing is that there are a lot of opportunities in terms of um, to maintain some level of production and we're here to help. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce my next colleague, uh, Doug Bright. He's from Himera. He'll be talking about uh, using environmental diagnostics and uh, using remote uh, tools and methods. Over to you, Doug. Thank you, Reggie. Good day, everyone. Uh, the first line of a poem by William Blake goes, to see a world in a grain of sand. So I don't think any of you signed on thinking we're going to do poetry, the poetry today, but, but here we're at. Um, Full disclosure, I actually haven't read through the full poem by William Blake, but uh, apparently it's about perspective and love and a whole bunch of other things. But So this particular presentation is not so much about seeing life and emerald processes within a grain of sand, but it is actually literally about seeing those kinds of processes within a drop of water or a very small uh, volume of water, for example. Um, so environmental DNA um, that's captured within water or within an environmental sample. Um, Ty's mentioned at the beginning that Asenko places a high uh, degree of importance on innovation, um, on finding a better way. We started down the path of using environmental DNA approaches for uh, mapping the distributions of at-risk species in, in Western Canada some six years ago. And, and when we were gone down that path and invested in the research and development, we hadn't thought about it in the context of, of making environmental decisions and managing in a, in global pandemic era, but it turns out to be quite relevant. And, and that's obviously an important theme for this particular webinar. Next slide, please. So I want to set a little bit of context first, and then we'll, we'll jump in and, and get a little bit more into what eDNA, eDNA, eDNA is and how it might be used. Um, there's not much question that for new projects and activities and even for existing activities, that getting environmental approvals and getting an environmental permitting, the permitting process has increasingly become more involved, more cost, and the overall process more unpredictable. At the same time, everybody in society, corporate entities, government entities, have tried to rise to the challenge of, of, of the human influence on the planet and the environment. So 
ISO 14001 systems and environmental management systems are more than three decades old now. Within the mining sector, we have uh, towards sustainable mining. Uh, every major organization um, uh, embraces a sustainability policy at the senior executive and board level and so on and so forth. So it's not like that people are going out of their way to create ex environmental externalities from our activities. And if, you, if, you, if, you, if, we, if we know better, we do better. There's still a lot of challenges with cumulative effects on the planet and, and, and the biosphere and, and, and ecosystems that we operate in. And I provided a list here, but, but really what it comes to is that a big chunk of the challenges we face are in our ability to understand the ecological processes and things that live in the environments that we operate. So uh, knowing uh, how pathogens are, are actually transported around, around the planet, knowing where at-risk species are, knowing what's a fish bearing stream and what's not a fish bearing stream. Um, so the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we face is we simply haven't been as good as we might, have, might be at, at being able to collect biological information to support decisions about the other kinds of things that we do. Next slide. So environmental DNA. Um, So it's, it's really environmental DNA is a set of methods for surveying, for monitoring, for assessment that really are intended to get at a different way of looking at living things um, within the world around us. And in a nutshell, we can define environmental DNA as any DNA that can be captured in an environmental sample, whether that's a water sample from a lake or a stream or the ocean or whatever, or a soil sample or an air sample where we're filtering materials in the air. So in a, in a nutshell, that's what, what DNA is. So environmental DNA approaches uh, that have actually come to the fore very much in the last, since about 2008, and particularly within the last five years, are really about looking for evidence of the presence and distributions of various biological organisms that are of management interest by looking for their DNA in the environmental media that, that, that surrounds them. So, so um, um, Where we've come from. So if we look at conventional ecological surveys, and I mentioned this or mentioned that there's some of their limitations earlier on, but the challenge with conventional ecological surveys is they actually, if you look critically, have relatively low power to detect organisms in the environment if they're, they, 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 they indeed exist. They tend to be labor intensive. We have to have teams of ecologists out in the field looking for doing fish surveys or doing plant surveys or whatever it is. They require specialized kind of expert knowledge uh, and within that knowledge comes a bias in, in particular observations. So the, the other thing that they typically involve is, 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 is two or more even larger groups of, of ecologists out in the field working in the habitat that we're aiming to protect, turning over rocks, um, looking in stream beds, um, digging up plants and other things in ways that are actually somewhat destructive to the habitat that we're in. The other aspect of that is that the, as, as a field biologist kind of works through that process, they run a high risk of introducing wildlife pathogens and, 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 and various other things into a new ecosystem, um, a pest species. So there are some challenges with ecological surveys. Next slide. So why environmental DNA? So these are the things that you'll hear time and time again that are a justification for switching to a new way surveys, um, looking for the DNA of an organism in a sample rather than looking for the organism itself. Um, uh, eDNA e has been time and time and time again to be more accurate, more sensitive um, than traditional surveys when we're looking particularly for species bi biota within the environment that basically have a very low de density, so they're cryptic or they're at risk species, so they're, they're, very, in, they're in very low density, so they're actually hard to see based on direct observation. That introduced species that say, for example, as part of transportation processes and transportation are actually conveyed from one ecosystem to, to another ecosystem, things like zebra mussels and, and, and baga mussel and things like that. Um, they can be more reliable. Uh, they are less invasive and they can actually be done 
by the appropriately trained field biologist with less uh, expertise with uh, about the organisms that they're looking for. So rather than having large crews, you can literally have one person. And above all, uh, the level of effort required to actually sample large areas and sample repeatedly is much lower than using conventional methods. So you could probably sample an order of magnitude more sites with the same level of effort with one person rather than multiple people uh, using eDNA techniques as opposed to uh, traditional ecological survey methods. So that last point in this bullet adheres to current social distancing, distancing requirements. So in a COVID, COVID era, what becomes port important now is that I can go out and I can use eDNA approaches by myself in the field with some appropriate um, um, considerations for other aspects of safety while working alone in remote locations without invoking a whole lot of people and actually um, simplifying the logis logistics immensely, these kinds of field visits in challenging time. Next slide, please. So for me, and, and this is why I, I'm personally so invested in, 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 in advancing eDNA methods, what all of this means in a nutshell, uh, just to, to bring it all home, is that the biggest advantage of the eDNA is it actually allows us to collect larger amounts of data about the ecological status of environments um, for the same or for less, lesser level of effort. We can actually train up multiple people. We can start to do crowdsourcing types of approaches for collecting data um, for living organisms within large watersheds and across watersheds and across landscapes. Uh, we can combine data from different researchers because there's a predictability in terms of how those interpretations are made that, 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 that rely less on specialized knowledge. And what we're really doing now is driving environmental decision making and environmental protection types of observations towards big data approaches. So we're really now being able to start to get the resolution of the data to see those kinds of, of patterns that are that may or may not be emerging based on human activity. Next slide. So the workflow is pretty straightforward. I mean, this all sounds kind of very high level, but, but fundamentally what it comes down to is, you know, and, and while it's just basically a sampling in a stream, stream ecosystem, looking for fish presence as an example. So when we design a survey, you need to know something about the ecosystems and, and, and the organisms we're interested in, whether that's uh, individual organisms or, or communities of organisms like benthic invertebrates in a stream environment. Um, you take the survey design, you go out in the field, you collect a sample. Typically, you could collect a water sample from the edge of a stream, for example, instead of wading into the stream and churning over rocks. Um, you field filter that sample, and it's the filter that captures the DNA in most cases for those kinds of applications. You preserve the filter using very simple methods. Um, then you can either extract that eDNA, typically in the laboratory, but there are actually field approaches for doing that and analyzing it. And then you might analyze that sample for the DNA in it using either uh, quantitative polymerase chain reaction types of approaches or high throughput sequencing approaches, depending whether you're interested in one or a few types of species or, or the whole community of species that may be present in that sample. And you do the interpretation. So it's a kind of a stepwise, fairly simple uh, process that, that actually is easy to teach people uh, and it's easy to develop standardized methods to create consistency. Uh, next slide. There are some limitations of environmental DNA. Like any tool, uh, there is a sweet spot where eDNA makes a lot of sense. And there are applications that are really beyond the limits of eDNA to provide us really good science and really good as a basis for good management decisions. One of the major limitations of environmental DNA is, is that we're looking for evidence of the DNA of a species in an environmental sample based on the recent presence in the proximity of where that sample was taken. What it doesn't tell us is actually the number of, of, of that particular organism or species that was, that was there in the environment. So it doesn't tell us about abundance or densities, for example, of an individual species or multiple species. We can actually count the number of copies of DNA of a given species within an environmental sample. That's pretty straightforward. But the challenge we have, uh, and this, this, is, this is, occurs globally, is that amount of DNA can be contributed, in this case, for example, using the diagrammatic here, by one really big fish, by one smaller fish that happens to be really close to the sampling location, by a midsize or any kind of fish that happens to be decomposing and shedding a lot of DNA, or by many fish. So there's a many ways that you can get to a certain amount of DNA in an environmental sample. So it's not as simple as it might seem. Next slide. 
So again, just to sum summarize, the, the, the biggest reason to consider environmental DNA as a, as a sampling approach has to do with our, our, uh, what will undoubtedly become a much expanded ability to collect ecological and biological information for the environments that we operate in and uh, um, where we're, 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 we're trying to drive um, important management decisions. There's a bunch of things about eDNA. When I collect a sample, I can archive it for days or months or years, so I can actually go back and answer, and, 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 and if there's new ecological, biological queries that come up, is there, was there an invasive species that I didn't know about 10 years ago that was there? I can actually pull that sample uh, and I can, I can reanalyze it and I can analyze it after the fast. But we, talk, we talked about archival types of approaches and, 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 and data uh, types of approaches. eDNA, if you haven't heard about it, and I know Brandon and others uh, on, on the call, some of you are, uh, have, have more than heard about it. If you haven't heard about it, you will. It's, 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 it's got an exponent, exponential growth phase, probably greater than COVID, and nobody's flattened the curve yet. So it uh, uh, currently is challenged a little bit in terms of uh, acceptance by environmental decision makers, but that's all changing very rapidly. In fact, we're working right now to develop a seed document to create the first international standard on reporting for eDNA type studies worldwide. Um, on behalf of the Canadian Standards Association. So it's in the works, it's coming. Thanks very much. Fantastic, thanks uh, Robin, Rajiv and Doug. Uh, <clears throat> again, for everybody on the line, if you've got any questions, um, please use the online panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Simply type in your question, click send, and we'll try and deal with them uh, as many as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, with that, um, Robin, a question for you, um, and how long does it take to uh, organize the remote site visit and, and again, where, where can you find synergies and, uh, and ways to, uh, to shortcut that process and make it as efficient as possible? Well? So, sorry, Tace, could you repeat that? So the question for you, Robin, is what is the shortest possible time that you can you think you can organize a remote site visit through? And where can you find time efficiencies? Um, I guess I guess in the uh, the Mark One quick case, it was it was organized over the span of uh, um, of about a fourteen hour flight. So you know, a couple of days is possible, but the amount of preparation time is is reflected in in the data that comes out. Um, I would say for a more robust site visit, sort of something like a week of preparation time is, is a reasonable uh, target. Um, some synergies can obviously be found in countries where we have done um, site visits previously so that there is uh, not, not some of those questions that hang out about logistics or proxies as an example. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Rajiv, uh, is it possible to tap into a site PCS remotely so as to be able to provide real-time optimization to support sites who may be struggling with uh, key personnel getting access during the pandemic? Yes, uh, yes, of course. As uh, Robin mentioned his, um, in his talk, there are different way, methods and ways we can actually tap into it. Uh, one of them being, you know, dialing up. But that, before that, we need to gain access to through the, the sites site restrictions and IT management. And so once you pass that hurdle, uh, it becomes easier. So one of the sites we're dealing with uh, in South America, we can actually dial into their uh, PCS system and we can see how the controller is performing and we can provide, I would say uh, not in real time because bandwidth is still an issue, but we can provide a diagnosis in, in the, within the next hour or so based on the how the controller is responding to the variability in feed or how the equipment's operating. Thank you. Well, well, I've got you another one for you, obviously, with um, uh, limited ability to get onto sites and giving the remoteness of some of the sites. Um, and you, you focused a lot on the need for trust. So how do you see the ability to build and maintain trust in the current environment? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah. It, if you've had previous relationship with the client, it becomes easier uh, to maintain um, the trust, I guess, and the collaboration, and you can carry on the work. 
Uh, so one of the clients I'm dealing with is so we, we we did a bit of work before and we established the relationship. So with the current circumstance, we we cannot travel the site. But yeah, well, look, the client said, look, you know, we, we still want you to remotely diagnose the the site issues. So we still do providing that help to this is a site in South America. And yeah, but it's slightly different for a, a new client. Um, coming in requesting help in the current circumstance. But I guess the, the the key motivation here is that we're here to help. We have the subject matter expertise to provide guidance and we've done it before. And we can provide case studies where if you have done it and Robin has done two case studies where they're doing due diligence work and there, there are new clients. And so there are ways and methodologies to once you uh, have the first engagement meeting uh, via Skype or uh, Teams meeting. Uh, you 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 have built that alignment. Once you get that alignment, you know, you, you formalize a trust relationship that we are going to do this bit of work and we're going to deliver. These are the outcomes. So. Very good, thank you, uh, Doug. One for you. Can eDNA save time and cost during baseline studies and EIA? preparation and the approval process, I guess? Yeah, very much so. And, and I think that's probably the biggest kind of applications we've seen, uh, particularly particularly in the mining sector, but also for transportation projects. And so you know, a typical example is that, um, you know, when we're planning for a new mine and, and the, the, the footprint in, and you know, watersheds that may or may not be affected, just depending on where we place the, the waste rock deposit, the TIMS facility and so on and so forth. We want to know, I mean, one of the basic questions is, is, uh, is a set of streams, particularly in, in, in the headwater reaches, is it fish bearing? And, you know, it's certainly, um, it's possible for some of these mines, particularly larger proposed projects, um, to go out and actually do electrofishing and, you know, and put in, you know, traps and all of the kinds of traditional things people do. There's a there's a, a, an eDNA test that actually allows us to test for the presence or, uh, or, or of, of any fish species, which one we actually call eFish developed collaboratively with the University of Victoria, right? So one of the things you can do is work up a watershed very quickly and, and look at tributaries and, and sample and very quickly establish for the entire tributary system where fish may occur and where they won't occur and allow you to, for, uh, for example, confirm what we believe are fish barriers, for example. So, so that's one example. But, but you know, typically, that would be done much more quickly than uh, than, than doing detailed fish surveys across the entire network. Very good, thank you, Doug. Uh, <clears throat> Robin, I think you you touched on this one a little bit, but. Um, there's clearly the, an, an added benefit of remote site visits to also deal with uh, transportation routes, other logistical challenges, the ability to um, include stakeholders in the in the due diligence interviews and the likes when we've got teams at site. Uh, absolutely, I think uh, <clears throat> I think the the, due, the the remote site visit effort allows for a collaboration when you analyze the data. Like I said, I think you. I can see a, a point where you've got a team of, of experts sitting around a table and, and analyzing everything from a, a route survey um, through through operating logs, in fact, and, and even um, even if, if infrastructure exists, even having um, uh, conversations with, with operators at site. So I, I do think that's um, entirely possible. Very good. Um, Rajiv, uh, question here, and we actually get quite a bit. Um, what impact are you seeing in the work you're doing um, from the uh, consumable supply chain for a lot of operations? It's not just about the people at site, but also getting uh, reagents and yeah. other consumables to site. And what strategies would you suggest uh, is possible to address that? Oh, it's an interesting one. So we, my colleagues from Australia, Matt Pyle, Grant Ballantyne, myself, we put, um, we'll be publishing a, a thought piece next week. Uh, talking about that and what are the challenges and, and the opportunities we, we should be uh, addressing. So at the moment, I have not seen any evidence that it's going to be a, a big supply chain impact on grinding media, for example, um, as a consumable. 
But if that's the case, um, I mean, there are ways. I mean, if you're looking at a conventional SAG uh, ball mill circuit, uh, you know, running at a reduced grinding media, almost in an ag mill, fully, fully autogenous mode, um, uh, which will, of, which will have a direct impact on throughput, but has uh, potential benefits in because you can actually grind it finer. Therefore, you can uh, recover your metal at a finer grind size. Therefore, you can maximize your revenue. Uh, whereas for a bore mill, yeah, similarly, you know, if you want to, you have to switch off your bore mill so you can run your ag mill in single stage mode, meaning basically without a bore mill. There are ways and there are strategies. Um, but it's just a matter of trying to uh, assess uh, what's the impact on throughput if we had to go at a reduced capacity and what would be the advantage uh, of in terms of running at a reduced operating cost as well. So you need to look at the bigger picture on the overall so the site's NPV assessment. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, again, if anybody else has got any questions, uh, please use your, your panel to, uh, to submit those. Um, Doug, is there a couple of uh, real world examples of where DNA is being used in a mining or similar context uh, at the moment that you can reference the audience to? Yeah, I, there's a, there are a number of uh, mines in British Columbia, for example, that are um, where DNA is being used uh, to look at microbial ecology, uh, both in a in a in a an effluent treatment and in a reclamation context. That's a slightly different way of of applying the DNA, for example, than looking for an individual fish, fish, fish species or multiple fish. But uh, that's what we kind of call call community community level eDNA analysis, where you take us literally a small sample. And you run the DNA, and 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 you uh, detect it. You make a long list of everything that's detected in that sample. So it allows us to figure out, for example, how microbes, and for example, things like mycorrhizal fungi or even plants, are colonizing a reclaimed area, for example. Fantastic. Well, it looks like we uh, we only got a couple of minutes to go, and um, no more questions at this point. So. On behalf of my colleagues and on behalf of Asenko, thank you for everybody joining uh, our current and hopefully future clients. We certainly appreciated the opportunity. I think uh, hopefully this has given you a, uh, a very high level snapshot of some of the innovative ways that Asenko uh, has been and always will strive to find a better way. We're always very focused on innovation, focused on finding different ways to add value. A lot of what we do uh, we do equally well in the current environment. Um, as a number of my colleagues have said, most of what we do will continue to be able to do and will be focused on uh, post the pandemic. There's uh, different ways to innovate and that's always been part of the Senko's DNA. So we appreciate your time on this Friday. Um, hopefully not, uh, uh, not too much longer for most of you to go. Uh, have a great weekend uh, and as always, stay safe, stay healthy and stay indoors. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you all.